is that anthrax was shipped out at least 74 times to dozens of labs in the U.S. and at least five foreign countries between January 2005 and May 2015. According to the report, Dugway scientists were using cobalt-60 gamma radiation to kill or deactivate anthrax specimens before shipping them to government or private labs for further research, but it were procedures for irradiating, irradiating anthrax did not account for variable amounts of spores treated in the gamma cell irradiator, noted the report. Additionally, those standard procedures failed to account for spore samples at varying concentration, volumes, and levels of irradiation. If inhaled, anthrax spores can be fatal, but so far there has no, no reports of infections. About 31 people who worked with the specimens are on antibox as a precaution. What's up in space? Spaceweather.com, active spun sunspot, ha AR2371 has an unstable Beta Gamma Delta magnetic field that harbors energy for strong explosions. NOAA forecasters estimate a 70% chance of M-class solar flares and a 15% chance of X flares on June 19th. Any such explosions will probably be geo-effective as the sunspot is turning to face Earth. A solstice aurora watch yesterday, June 18th, sunspot AR2371 unleashed the strongest solar flare in nearly two months. The M3 class explosion caused a brief shortwave radio blackout over North America and it hurled a CME into space. ESA's Solar and Heliospheric Observatory recorded a movie of the expanding cloud. The CME is not heading directly for Earth. Nevertheless, it is probably geo-effective. According to NOAA computer models, the CME should deliver a glancing blow to our planet's magnetic field during the late hours of June 21st. High-latitude sky watchers should be alert for solstice auroras. Real-time space weather photo gallery. Sunset sky show. Readers, if you have not been paying attention to the early evening sky, please start. The two brightest planets, Venus and Je Jupiter, are converging in the west for a spectacular side-by-side -side conjunction. Photographer Kat Connor sends this picture from Mammoth Lakes, California. And from the BBC News, number of displaced worldwide hits high. The UN reports thousands of civilians have fled fighting in the IS-held Syrian town of Tal Abad Yad. Abayad. The number of people displaced by war, conflict of persecution reached a record high of nearly 60 million around the world in 2014, a UN report says. Well, I bet they're happy about that. The document by the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, says the number of people forced to flee their homes rose by 8.3 million from the previous year. The continuing conflict in Syria is seen as a major factor behind the record numbers. UNHCR 8 head Antonia Guterres told the BBC the world is a mess. It sure is. The drama is that the people think that humanitarians can clean up the mess. It's no longer possible. We have no capacities to pick up the pieces. More and more people are suffering and unfortunately for many of them there is no chance to support them. Mr. Guterres says that the number of displaced people had increased to 42,000 per day in 2014 from 32,000 the year before. The report says that at least, I'll let you, uh, I'm going to hold here, you can uh, stop or pause the video and take a look at that. The report says that at least 15 conflicts have erupted or reignited in the past five years, including eight in Africa and three in the Middle East. This led to 59 million displaced people by the end of 2014, of whom 38.2 million were displaced in their own country by internal conflict. Wars in Ukraine, Nigeria, South Sudan swelled the figures last year, the UNHCR said. On the, of the 59 million total, the report said 19 0.5 million were refugees. More than half of the refugees were children. Another 1.8 million people were awaiting the outcome of claims for asylum. I'm going to let you look at these pictures. Ugh. There's a video here too if you want to check it out. I don't do videos anymore. Um, 
uh, unless they're my own that is so next story and on June 17th Islamic State car bombs kill or injure 50 in Yemeni capital the carnage just continues by Mohammed um, car bombs killed or injured at least 50 people near mosque and headquarters of Yemen's dominant Houthi group in Sana'a on Wednesday and coordinated attacks claimed by ISIS. The four blasts rocked the capital as Saudi-led forces conducted more airstrikes against Houthi military bases across Yemen and Houthi delegates attending peace talks in Switzerland reported the first tentative progress on the second day of a UN-sponsored push for a Ramadan truce. A security official said at least 50 people were killed or wounded in the attacks on the Hashush Mosque, the Kipsky, Kipsi Mosque, the uh, Al Qadra Mosque, and the political bureau of the Ansarullah movement of the Houthis, who belong to the Zaidi sect of Shiite Islam. The explosion was so loud I thought it was caused by an airstrike, said a man in his 70s named Ali who had just left a mosque when a bomb went off. I returned and found cars burning, people screaming, wounded people all over. The Sunni Muslim Islamic State said in a statement posted online it carried out the tax. The world, folks, is in a state of murder. People, there are so many people infected with devils to want to kill. It is disgusting. The soldiers of the Islamic State in Yemen in a wave of military operations as revenge for the Muslims against the Houthi apostates detonated four car bombs near the centers of Houthi apostasy, it said. The attack is the most serious of its kind in Yemen since suicide bombers killed at least 137 worshippers and wounded hundreds during Friday prayers at two mosques in Sana'a on March 20th in attacks also claimed by Islam, Islamic State. And we think that this one uh, slaughter of nine black people in South Carolina, I believe, uh, is something terrible when you see all this carnage going across the world. No, you, the U.S. is still a blessed country, cons even considering we have a Muslim in the White House. Now I find this news very interesting in concordance with the seven-year covenant. Hamas close to agreeing five-year ceasefire with Israel, it says. From this magazine, I can't pronounce it. But, um, and this was reported on the 16th, three days ago. Seeking a unilateral agreement with Tel Aviv, bypassing Palestinian Authority. Senior Hamas leader Musa Abu Marzouk speaks during an interview with the Associated Press in Gaza City on Tuesday, June 10th. R Ramallah and Ashark al Walsat, <laughs> Hamas and Israel are close to agreeing on a five-year truce plan after two weeks of continuing or continued discussions between both sides, informed sources have told Al-Sat. The plan proposed by Qatar and supported by Turkey as well as a number of EU countries and the UN would see Hamas and Israel declare a five-year ceasefire in exchange for Israel, easing its blockade of Gaza, speeding up the process of rebuilding the Strip and constructing a floating seaport on the Gaza coast. Make it a little bigger. The plan could also be extended beyond the five years. The sources said Musa Abu Marzouk, the senior Hamas member in charge of the file, had recently discussed the plan with UN representatives Nikolai Mladenov, that it, and that it had been well received by the most of the Hamas leadership. According to a number of Palestinian, Israeli, and Egyptian sources, Marzouk and other senior members of the group on Saturday headed to Doha, where they will discuss the proposal with Hamas leader Michal, who currently resides in the Qatari capital. So, I find this interesting because, you know, in Isaiah, in Isaiah 17, the burden of Damascus, this whole chapter is about the burden of Damascus and what's going to happen. It'll be a city of no more. 
but at the very end it tells the event how long it's going to take. The nations shall rush like the rushing of many waters, but God shall rebuke them, and they shall flee fear off, and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind, and like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. And behold, at evening tide trouble, and before the morning he is not. This is the portion of them that spoil us, and the lot of them that rob us. So, the, the fight starts in the evening, and before morning it's already gone. Maybe six, eight hours? Uh, could it be a nuclear explosion ending it? Very well could be. Could this be Psalms 83 war? Yes, it very well could be as well. The end of Damascus. Uh, what am, am I trying to say? I believe that this uh, ties in right around the rapture. Uh, could be before, could be after. Uh, there could be a, a gap of, you know, 10 or 15 days before the uh, seven-year peace treaty, peace, not peace treaty, uh, covenant is signed, as it says in Daniel 9, 27, which does say, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall call, cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So in the midst of the week, we have the sacrifice oblation to cease. This is what we call the abomination of desolation. And there it says it right there, abomination. And it's spoken off also in 2 Thessalonians. And so, uh, but they have this covenant for one week, stands for seven years. So, we also know that the day of the Lord starts with the thief in the night, Jesus coming to steal his bride. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should take overtake you as a thief. Why? Why is the brethren not going to be overtaken by the thief? Because we are the thief's jewels that he takes to heaven. Because we are the children of light, as it says here, the children of the day. But the point here is, is that I was bringing this up, is first we have the thief coming in the night, okay? And the Lord comes as a thief. And so then it says peace and safety. So it, it looks like we're going to have a, a, a covenant signed right after um, I'm sorry, the rapture is going to happen because it says, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. You see? So it's very possible that the seven-year covenant is signed and immediately the rapture happens. But I believe that the seven-year covenant has to start first with a war preceding that so that there will be a covenant signed. And then there will be war again right after. I mean, I, I mean, I might be wrong, but I'm just saying it seems that way according to scripture. Anyway, let's go to the next news. And that one from the examiner says right here, author Muslim spies in churches to catalog Jews and Christians for jihad. Jewish author A.V. Lipkin warns that Muslims spies in churches. While speaking at the Future Conference held at Skyline Church in San Diego, California, Jewish author A.V. Lipkin said all churches in the U.S. have been infiltrated by Muslim spies in order to document and catalog Jews and Christians in preparation for violent jihad, the Christian Post reported Tuesday. According to Lipkin, these spies pretend to be born-again Christian believers in order to deceive their intended targets. We are realizing with our own very eyes fulfillment of more Bible prophecy than in many other generation in 2,000 years, he said. I believe the Messiah in, is in our time, and I believe Israel will realize its borders. This is very... Uh, you know, this, this really goes along with uh, realizing that uh, the church was never a building. The church is a body of believers meeting and it started by meeting in houses. 
and it never was a building and there's no reason that you have to go to church you you know in other words you're being set up and uh, they're going to be a targeting as you he just says they're setting you all up and picking and choosing who they will do violent jihad against and don't think that they don't know your address just because you go to that church you'd be surprised so it is very dangerous for a Muslim to be even associated with Christian missionaries or Christian churches unless they are spies. He said, my wife has picked up broadcasts that say all the churches in America have Muslim spies in them, including former Christians who converted to Islam. When Muslims come to you and say, oh yes, we have accepted Christ and we are born again, you got to be real careful because lying in Arabic is not only permissible, it is commanded he added lying is a virtue in islam to defeat your enemy he cited the case of one middle eastern muslim doctor who applied for a canadian visa according to his account radical muslims demanded she record personal information addresses and phone numbers of her jewish and christian patients in edmonton they further demanded she provided that information on disc so that they would know who to kill once the order for jihad was issued he claimed when a war breaks out in the Middle East and orders for jihad come to the Muslims of Canada, the Muslims of Edmonton will kill the Jews of Edmonton, and the Muslims of Toronto will kill the Jews of Toronto, and the Muslims of Vancouver will kill the Jews of Vancouver. He said, this was in 1999, but even now, they are cataloging the Jews whatever, wherever the Jews live. The Muslims like to have ecumenical relations with the Jews because they want to know who are the Jews, and they go to the rabbis and want to be best friends with a rabbi they want to get close with the rabbi because it will be easier to reach him and kill him once the order goes out jews will be targeted for death on saturday and christians will be targeted on sunday he explained allah wants to kill the jews on saturday and to kill the christians on sunday why obviously most of the jews worship on saturday the sabbath day the sabbath keepers and christians sunday Kill the Hindus, kill the Buddhists, kill the blacks in Africa, and the Muslims kill each other, all in the name of Allah, he said. The bottom line in Islam is that every Jew dies, and after that, every Christian dies. Jesus Christ is coming back. Next up, from the Telegraph. Area 51 and extraterrestrial life both exist, says head of NASA. NASA Administrator Major Charles Frank Bolden Jr. said that the alien life does exist, but it is not being kept secret in Area 51. Extraterrestrial life does exist. N NASA Administrator Major Charles Bolden told British school children that he was confident that scientists would find life outside of Earth because there were so many planets that are similar to our own. Asked by 10-year-old Carmen Deering, if he believed in aliens, he said, I do believe that we will someday find other forms of life or a form of life, if not in our solar system, then in some of the other solar systems, the billions of solar systems in the universe. You can take a look at this video. I'll be leaving all the links, links down below in the information box. Today, we know that there are literally thousands, if not millions, of other planets, many of which may be very similar to our own Earth. So some of us, many of us, that we're going to find evidence that there is life elsewhere in the universe. Major Bolden also admitted that Area 51 existed, but said the U.S. government was not hiding any alien life there. There is an Area 51, he said. It's not what many people think, though. I've been to a place called that... It but it's a normal research and development place. I never saw any aliens or alien spacecraft or anything when I was there. I wonder if you should believe all this. It think because of the secrecy of the aeronautics research that goes on there, it's uh, ripe for people to talk about aliens being, being there. The existence in Area 51 has been a badly kept secret for decades and it has fueled the imaginations of conspiracy theorists and UFO hunters around the world. In 13, 2013, the Central CIA acknowledged its exact location in Nevada near Groom Lake in a series of documents released as part of a Freedom of Information request. The documents describe how the facility had been used during the Second World War as an aerial gunning gunnery for the Army Air Corps pilots. President Dwight 
Eisenhower later approved this strip of wasteland known by its map designation as Area 51 to the Atomic Energy Commission's Nevada Test Site and Training Range. It then became central in the development of the U-2 spy plane. Major Bolden also said that one of the main reasons humans have not yet landed on Mars was down to the lack of adequate toilet facilities. <laughs> NASA is hoping to send humans to Mars in the 2030s but said there were technological hurdles that still needed to be overcome. Goal is to have us there in the early 30s. They won't land. They'll probably do an orbital mission like the first time we went to the moon. We've got to get the Martian surface ready for human habitation. We're not going to send humans down to the surface of Mars to build the habitats, the houses. We're probably going to use robots. Our technical abilities are not what we want it to be now. We need better life support systems. We need a toilet that's not going to break on the way there. Then when we get to the Martian surface, we need a toilet that's going to work over and over again. Toilets are a big deal. <laughs> Major Bolden was also asked if he become frustrated by conspiracy theorists who claim the moon landing was faked. I understand people have doubts. He said, I have no doubts. We went to the moon and I have no doubts that we're going to Mars in your lifetime. Mr. Bull was answering questions for the children's newspaper First News show Hot Seat where it's broadcast on Sky News. Next up, Newsmax reports Senator Rand Paul to unveil 14.5% flat tax for all. Is this good? Kentucky Senator Rand Paul outlined some of the highlights of a fair and flat tax plan he was to unveil on Capitol Hill later on Thursday, saying that the measure will not only simplify the nation's sprawling tax code, but will allow Americans to keep more of the money they've earned. We have a 70,000 page tax code and we're chasing businesses overseas, the Republican lawmaker, also a candidate for the presidency, told Fox News. Well, I'm going to stop right there for a couple reasons. Number one, I believe the rapture is going to happen before any of this comes in to play. Number two, even if the rapture doesn't happen, this country is going down the hole, and this so this story is not important. Number three, Rand Paul is never going to make it for a president. He's too good of a person, sounds like to me, to make presidency. The global elites will not allow it. Next news from the Sputnik International. Russian help needed to establish peace in Syria, Iraq, French, ex-PM Filin. The U Ukrainian crisis needs to be resolved and a large alliance with Russia is needed in order to establish peace in Syria and Iraq, former French Prime Minister Francois Fillon told Sputnik on, on the sidelines of St. Petersburg International Economic Forum. Fillon said it's necessary to solve the Ukrainian issue and a large alliance with Russia needs to be made in order to establish peace in Syria and Iraq. Fillon was appointed a French Prime Minister by then President Nikolai Sarkozy in 2007 and left the office in 12 after Sarkozy lost to Francois Hollande in 2012 election. Syria has been embroiled in a civil war since 2011 between the governments of President Bashar Assad and many insurgent groups, including the Islamic State that controls more than 50% of the country, according to the UK-based Syrian Observatory for Human Rights. ISIL has taken over large parts of Iraq as well. On May 17th, it seized the city of Ramadi, located just 80 miles from the Iraqi capital of Baghdad. Earlier in the day, Russian Foreign Prime Minister Sergei Lavrov said there is no serious international issue in today's world that could be solved without Russia's participation. France wants the whole world to replace U.S. to force peace process. French Foreign Minister is singing, I got the whole world in my hands. Hmm. Is he going to be the next Antichrist? Some say he is. Since he, he talked about the 500 days till global warming, uh, issues in, in September. French Foreign Minister Lauren Fabias is launching a new effort to resurrect the peace process that nobody seems to want except for Western leaders who see the world from hotel rooms and airplanes. He is traveling to the Middle East where he plans to meet with Arab League ministers on Saturday and then with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Palestinian Authority Chairman Mahmoud Abbas on Sunday. 
What new angle could Fabius possibly have in mind to succeed after failures of U.S. Secretaries of State James Baker, Lawrence Eagleburger, Warren It Christopher, Madeleine Albright, Colin Powell, Condoleezza Rice, and Hillary Rodden Clinton, John Kerry, and Special Envoy George Mitchell? And who else? The common denominator in the above names is that they are all Americans. The Fabius figures that is the problem, a senior French diplomat told Reuters. The method to reach a definite, definitive solution has been both sides to meet face to face with the Americans as an honest broker, but this method has failed. It needs international support. It is not. As if the United States failed alone, the quartet, consisting of the U.S., Russia, the United Nations, and European Union, also the escorted the Palestinian Authority to the grave pit that all of them dug for the peace process. Fabius is building his illusion on the fallacy that, according to the same diplomat, we can no longer isolate the Israeli-Palestinian conflict from the regional context. Once upon a time, the failure of an agreement between the Palestinian Authority and the Israel was the supposed root cause of unrest in the Arab world. Then the disagreement became the reason that no one except perhaps Israel could stop Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Now the fall guy is the Islamic State. The diplomat said the current inertia is deadly because if there is not agreement, the ISIS will adopt the Palestinian Authority clause. Cause. Abbas already has rejected the French proposal for a resolution in the UN's Security Council to give both sides 18 months to agree, meaning Israel must agree to Abbas terms. Abbas' problem is that the French resolution would recognize Israel as a Jewish state, and he cannot stomach that. Fabius, like Kerry, doesn't take no for an answer, at least not for 18 months. The French foreign minister forgets it is he and not he who has the whole world in his hands. Next up, ECB boosts emergency funding as Greek banks bleed to Sopras calm. The European Central Bank expanded emergency funding to keep Greece's stricken banks on their feet as a steady flow of withdrawals continued on Friday ahead of a summit next week that could decide whether the country can stay in the euro. With pressure on Greece's fragile banking system growing daily, the ECB held a teleconference and raised the cap on so-called emergency liquidity assistance, which the banks rely on to keep operating by 1.8 billion euros. That should be enough to keep the system running until Eurozone leaders meet on Monday night in a last-ditch effort to reach an aid for reforms deal with Athens. As the country edged closer to a possible default at the end of the month, leftist Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras assured Greeks that profits of crisis and terror would be confounded and his government would strike a deal with the European Union and IMF creditors. The Japan Times reports farmers work their field as Mount Sanabon spews volcanic material into the air in Sokendebi, North Sumatra, Indonesia, Wednesday. Mount Sinabung, one of about 130 active volcanoes in the country, has been put at the highest alert level since June 2nd due to the growing size of its lava dome. Volatile Indonesia volcano set to blow, but the thousands of villagers refuse to flee. Thousands of villagers are refusing to leave their homes on the slopes of one of Indonesia's most volatile volcanoes despite warnings that it is poised for a powerful eruption. Mount Sinabung, one of about 130 volcanoes as I said, are at the highest alert for nearly two weeks. On Tuesday, at least 48 avalanches of hot ash barreled down its slopes with the biggest reaching 1.5 miles southeastward. The volcano in northern Sumatra, one of the Indonesian's main island, has also been shooting smoke and ash more than 2,300 feet into the air. Several thousand people, including women carrying babies in slings, have left the mountain in police trucks since Monday after the volcanic activity intensified over the weekend. Some streamed down the scorched slopes on motorcycles, their faces caked in ash. But Sabur Tambun, who Heads the local disaster mitigation agency said only 10,000 of the 33,000 people living within the main danger zone have moved into tent camps or government buildings a safe distance from the volcano. No injuries have been reported yet from the recent eruptions. 
The villagers insisted on tending crops, Tablin said. They are confident of being able to escape a major eruption. All we can do is ask them to leave. The 8,170 foot Mount Cinnabung has erupted sporadically since 2010 when it caught scientists off guard and blew it after being quiet for four centuries. Last year, a powerful explosion heard hundreds of miles away des destroyed villagers around its slopes and killed at least 17 people. For days, authorities have pleaded with the villagers in the main danger zone, which stretches four miles to the south and southeast of the peak, to move to the temporary shelters but have faced resistance. We have lost our vegetables but not coffee, said Sapta from the Gambur village about three miles from the smoldering peak. Coffee has let us survive and we have to take care of it now. Boy, isn't that sound foolish? Next story. And another volcano, Mount Shindig, erupts for a second time. Back to life Thursday as a second eruption rocked Kuchinurubu Island off Kagoshima Prefecture shortly past noon, the meteorological agency said. The scale of the volcano's first eruption in 20 days was smaller than its May 29 blast, but apparently took from 12.17 p.m. to 12.47 p.m. to complete, the weather agency said. Initially, the agency had difficulty confirming the eruption because of bad weather, but a Japan Coast Guard vessel reportedly confirmed seeing small rocks falling while on patrol about nine kilometers east of the volcano. The eruption follows the volcano's mighty blast in May, which forced the sparsely populated island's residents to flee to neighboring Yakushima Island. Although the agency had said volcanic activity on Kuchinurabu had halted since last month's blast, earthquakes started rattling the area earlier this week with 10 on Tuesday, 31 on Wednesday, and 7 by 9 a.m. Thursday, the agency said. Kuchanarabo's <laughs> eruption alert remains at 5, the highest level, and residents in the area have been warned to remain alert for e further eruptions. Pentagon is building cruise missile shield to defend U.S. cities from Russia. The military moves to set up an expensive sensor and shooter network, but is the threat real? The Pentagon is quietly working to set up an elaborate network of defenses to protect American cities from a barrage of Russian cruise missiles. The plan calls for buying radars that would enable National Guard F-16 fighter jets to spot and shoot down fast and low-flying missiles. You know, I have an answer. Why don't we stop putting our missiles and all of our armament on the border of Russia so we don't have to build up all this here and stop threatening Russia. Wouldn't that be like a no-brainer? Amazing. Top generals want to network over the those radars with sensor-laden aerostat balloons hovering over U.S. cities and with coastal warships equipped equipped with sensors and interceptor missiles of their own. One of those generals is Admiral William Gortney, who leads U.S. Northern Command, or NORTHCOM, and North American Aerospace Defense Command, or NORAD. Earlier this year, Gortney submitted an urgent need request to put ASA radars on the F-16s that patrol the airspace around Washington. Such a request allows a project to circumvent the normal procurement process. While no one will talk openly about the Pentagon's overall cruise missile defense plans, much of which remain classified, senior military officials have provided clues in speeches, congressional hearings, or other public forums over the past year. The statements reveal the Pentagon's concern about advanced cruise missiles being developed by Russia. We're devoting a good deal of attention to ensuring we've properly or were properly configured against such an attack in the homeland and we need to continue to do so, Admiral Sandy Winfield, Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said during a May 19th speech at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington. 
In recent years, the Pentagon has invested heavily with the mixed results in ballistic missile defense preparations to shoot down long-range rockets that touch the edge of space and then fall toward targets on Earth. Experts say North Korea and Iran are the countries most likely to strike the U.S. or its allies with such missiles, although neither arsenal has missiles of sufficient range so far. Next up from BBC News, Russian fury at Belgium as asset seizure in Yukos oil case. Mikhail Kordakovsky and his partners sued the Russian state after Yukos was broken up. Russia has protested to the Belgium ambassador over the seizure of Russian state assets in Belgium, a move triggered by a court ruling over the now defunct Yukos oil firm. The ambassador was told that the asset seizure was an openly hostile act at that crudely violates the recognized norms of international law. Last year, a court told Russia to pay Euro Yukos shareholders 50 billion in compensation after Yukos breakup. A Russian state firm took over Yukos. Last July, an international arbitration court in the Hague the Hague said Russian officials had manipulated the legal system to bankrupt Yukos and jail its boss, the oligarch Mikhail Kordakovsky. Wider seizures. France has also seized Russian state accounts in about 40 banks, along with eight or nine buildings, AFP News Agency reports. An illegal application has also been filed to seize Russian assets in the UK and US, a lawyer acting for Yukos shareholders told the BBC. Lawyer Tim Osborne is the director of GML, a Gibraltar registered holding company representing the shareholders. The Russian state has made no effort to pay or engage with us. All of its statements and actions suggest it has no regard for international law or the rule of law, he told the BBC. He said that asset seizure was slower in the UK and US under their common law system than in France and Belgium. I think it will take years to seize assets here because Russia will use tactics to delay, he said. The, the targeted assets are mostly bank accounts and real estate. but. At some stage, we'll look at state-owned companies, too, he added. Next up, the Jerusalem Post says Arab-Israeli conflict. If conflict not resolved, ISIS will make Palestinian cause its own. Ahead of Fabius' visit to region, French diplomat calls stalled peace process deadly. Palestinians walk near an opening in Israel's controversial barrier in the East Jerusalem neighborhood. Paris, France, Foreign Minister's lead, excuse me, Paris, France's Foreign Minister heads to the Middle East this weekend with an initiative aimed at bringing Israel and the Palestinians back to peace talks under an international framework and grow amid growing regional instability. U.S.-led efforts to broker peace for a two-state solution collapsed in April 2014, and leaders on both sides have since been weakened politically. But with the region's crisis worsening, France sees a narrow window to resume negotiations. Foreign Minister Lauren Fabius will explore the prospects for talks with Arab League ministers in Cairo on Saturday and Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas in Ramallah and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in Jerusalem on Sunday. So, kind of looks like it's possible. Lauren Fabius could be, or Fabius could be, the Antichrist. It, possible. Palestinians flock to Jerusalem to attend First Friday Prayer of Ramadan. Police expecting thousands of Muslims to come in different areas such as Ramallah, Bethlehem, and Hebron. West Bank residents crossed on Friday the checkpoints separating them from Jerusalem on their way to Ramadan's First Friday Prayers at Al-Aqsa Mosque, the third holiest site in Islam. The Aqsa compound includes the octagonal, octagonal Dome of the Rock, which was built by Jerusalem's Arab conquerors in 691 on the spot where Muslims say the Prophet Muhammad began his night journey to heaven. Like in previous years, the Palestinian police worked alongside Israeli border police to control the crowd at Kalandia, Ramallah's checkpoint, and 
at Bethlehem checkpoint. Israel border police also positioned its force in several key locations across Jerusalem's old city where Al-Aqsa is located. Israeli police spokesman Mickey Rosenfeld said that all necessary security arrangements for the Palestinians to come through have been finalized. The Israeli police have completed final security measures that will be implemented in and around the old city throughout the day. We're expecting thousands of Muslims to come in from different areas such as Ramallah, Bethlehem and Hebron. This has been done in full coordination and extra police units will be in and around different areas to make sure that everyone comes in the old city without any problems. But at the same time we will respond if necessary to any security related issues. Well. As I have said before, there's two places in the Bible that says the Gentiles will overrun and trample over the great holy city, Jerusalem. In Revelation 11 it says, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out. And measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall be they tread under foot forty and two months. Three and a half years. The first half of the tribulation. Is that about to happen? Well, think about it. They're letting all these Muslims come in to Jerusalem to practice their uh, yearly Ramadan festival. Could that be a permanent thing? to trample over half of the city but again it says in Zechariah 14 2 for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle and the city shall be taken and the houses rifled and the women ravished and half of the city shall go forth into captivity and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city so we're not sure how far into the day of the Lord this happens. It does say the day of the Lord right here, which is after the tribulation starts. But again, it's, it's saying half of the city shall go into captivity and the residue of the people shall not be cut off, which means the Jews. Again, we see a trampling over the holy city. Now in Luke 21, 20, it says, and when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. So the desolation is the mid-tribulation abomination of desolation. Next story about Rush Limbaugh. Host Limbaugh suffering more woes with talk radio in big markets. Rush, the Rush Limbaugh woes are still adding up a, a month after being notified he was getting dumped by his Boston Talk radio host station. While Limbaugh is on another AM radio station in the city, the station currently boasts a .6 rating and trails four non-commercial stations in the market, according to the Examiner. Um, probably because the country's taken over by Islam, slowly. The station, WKOX, is the type of bottom-rung affiliate that Rush Limbaugh was rarely associated with during his halcyon days as the king of talk radio. But those days seem to be dwindling as the Boston fall from grace has previously played out for Rush in places like Los Angeles and Indianapolis. In each instance, Limbaugh excited, exited a prosperous longtime radio home and was forced to settle for an also-ran outlet with minuscule ratings. Rush Limbaugh's woes can be traced to his 2012 on-air meltdown over Sandra Fluke where he castigated and insulted the graduate student for three days on his program, calling her a slut and suggesting she post videos of herself having sex on the internet. Fluke's sin in the eyes of Limbaugh was testifying before Congress in favor of contraception mandates for health care insurance. Rush Limbaugh's woes are still adding up as the radio host loses more market share. The astonishing monologues by the radio announcer sparked an unprecedented advertiser exodus which means selling his show has become a major lift for the affiliate stations that pay a hefty fee for the right to carry his program. The Wall Street Journal has reported on the millions of dollars in advertising revenue that his host stations lose because of the station stigma on Madison Avenue. 
the still unfolding repercussions. Some key stations went out of their Rush Limbaugh deals as it continues to be on a rating slide. And when those deals are up, nobody else is stepping forward to ink new contracts with the radio hosts. Here's what happened in Boston and it be, it's becoming a trend. In May, WRKO announced it wasn't renewing the syndicated talk radio program, which meant the host would have to find a new home on the dial. No problem? Right. Hopping around to another affiliate isn't that unusual in the world of syndicated radio. What was unusual, at least for Limbaugh, was that not one other Boston station moved to pick up his show. Years ago, general managers lined up for the chance to broadcast Rush's ratings heavyweight show and jumped whenever it became available in the market. But no more. With ratings declining in recent years and selling the show to advertisers Becoming increasingly difficult, stations seemed reluctant to pay a steep price for the radio announcer's program. At Rush Limbaugh's woes continue, the syndicator Premier Radio Networks is still stuck paying the $50 million a year fee. Transgender is, excuse me, transgender is what's new. Sodomy is old now. Transgender woman sings national anthem at pro sports event for first time. Isn't this amazing? Brianna Sinclair becomes first transgender person. And we call her a person, okay? Because it's a male turned into a woman. Transgender woman, Brianna Sinclair, made history Wednesday night by becoming the first transgender person to sing the national anthem at a professional sporting event. Well, hallelujah, let's bring God's wrath to America. Sinclair, a classically trained opera singer, took to the mound at Oakland's OCO Coliseum to belt out the star-spangled banner before the the A's faced off against the San Diego Padres in the first game of the two-game series. She says, it means a lot. I feel very honored. Sinclair told the Associated Press of the experience, I used to be a homeless in New York City. I think from being homeless to getting my bachelor's degree and my master's degree to this is just kind of mesmerizing to me to have such a group of people that support me and love me and want me to succeed. I'm so thankful for them. Sinclair's performance came on Athletics Pride Night at the Coliseum. The A's honored Glenn Burke, baseball's first openly gay player who played for the team between 78 and 79. Berg died of complications from AIDS in 1995. Billy Bean, Major League Baseball's ambassador for inclusion and an openly gay former player himself, reportedly greeted members of Burke's family before the game. Burke's brother, Sidney, threw out the first pitch. I'll tell you as a player, if it had, I had seen that, I wouldn't would have passed out, Bean told the San Jose Mercury News of Sinclair National Anthem performance. Today is a perfect win for this organization and for baseball. From the tower, a sermon of hate in the District of Columbia. You wouldn't expect conspiracy theories about Jews and and their control of world events to be promoted in a church today, but that is what exactly was preached last month in Washington. It was clear May morning and the sun streamed into DC's Sixth Presbyterian Church through colorful mosaic windows, splashing off the stone columns and saturating the dark wooden altar. Handwritten signs directly directed a steady trickle of attendees into the room where they exchanged greetings before scattering among the pews. In the end, there were over 60 people gathered. There was an air of anticipation as the choir reached its final crescendo and a young man rose to the pulpit, introduced as the Reverend Dr. Heber M. Brown III. He was a senior preacher at a Baptist church in Baltimore. He had been involved in the protests that rocked the city after the arrest and death of Freddie Gray and spoke of walking side by side with a diverse coalition of faith groups and street gangs, the Crips and the Blood, the Fruit of Islam, and Christians of all stripes had united on Baltimore Street in pursuit of social justice. Brown painted vivid pictures of communities rising up in rebellion to defend its dignity. But then the Reverend began to speak about his visit to Israel and the Palestinian territories. There, he said, he met the Israeli occupation forces at Ben Gurion Airport, visited the apartheid 
wall and marched in Ramallah with a Palestinian sister who helped him understand who really controls Congress and who really can tell the president what to do. Such rhetoric seemed more suited to a hate rally than a small African-American church in the nation's capital, but it electrified Reverend Brown's audience, which had gathered there for a very specific purpose. They were attending a spring program by Sabil DC Metro, which sought to persuade African-American Christians and churches to join crusade against the state of Israel. Sabil DC Metro is an affiliate group of Friends of Sabil North America FOSNA, which is itself an arm of a Sabil Ecumenical Liberation Theology Center in the U.S. and Canada. Sabil was founded in the early 1990s by Reverend Dr. Naeem Atik, a Palestinian priest of the Anglican Church, who introduced a Palestinian variation of radical liberation theology. The organization was the culmination of Atik's efforts to advance an alternative interpretation of the Christian Bible that is nourished by the hopes, dreams, and struggles of the Palestinian people. Atik's theology, which supposedly challenges a literal understanding of the Old Testament as a Zionist text, features violent imagery that depicts Jewish acts of deicide as well as forceful repudiations of Jewish national self-determination. During Christmas celebrations in 2000, Atik spoke of destructive modern-day Herods in the Israeli government and in his 2001 Easter address declared that Palestine Stein has become one huge Golgotha. The Israeli government crucifixion system is operating daily. He later likened the occupation of the West Bank to the stone placed on the entrance of Jesus' tomb. In one particular memorable address, he compared Israel's creation to original sin and contested that Judaism does not teach its adherents to love non-Jews. Considering the role such libels have played in the oppression and destruction of the Jewish communities for centuries, one would think that characterizing Israelis as modern-day Christ-killers would be reasonable grounds for allegations of anti-Semitism. Sabil, of course, strenuously denies this. In an open letter published in 2005, then Fosna board chair Reverend Dr. Richard K. Toll wrote, Sabil and Canon Atik have been accused of being anti-Semitic even though Sabil consistently condemns anti-Semitism in all its ugly forms. Sabil is accused of being anti-Semitic because we dare to criticize the policies of the State of Israel. Sabil uses the language of liberation theology. That theology speaks with words such as oppressed and oppressor. It speaks of suffering and crucifixion, biblical images that relate to the experience of brutality and the misuse of power. Those who do not want the State of Israel to be criticized deny these accusations and label liberation theology as anti-Semitic. They deny the violence of the occupation and all of its ugly ramifications, sec settlements, land confiscations, demol demolition of homes, state violence against civilians. Toll's tolerance of Atik's blatant anti-Semitism and deliberate misrepresentation of his critics' concerns underscores Fosna's willingness to endorse hateful rhetoric while professing to support nonviolent re reconciliation. Indeed, Fosna energetically promotes Atik's variation on liberation theology through affiliates across North America, Europe, and Australia, establishing an ecumenical network of churches that works to advance Atik's idea in the West. Today, Sabil is an official partner of the Presbyterian Church, USA, the principal Presbyterian body in North America. In 2012, he voted to boycott goods manufactured in Israeli settlements. Two years later, it narrowly voted to divest an estimated 21 million of the church's holdings from Caterpillar, Hewlett Packard and Motorola Solutions, all of which manufacture products used by Israel in the Palestinian territories. These resolutions were the culmination of a decade of wrangling within and outside 
USA over the question of divestment from Israel. The controversy featured multiple votes, amendments, and even the sale of a study guide entitled Zionism Unsettled, which condemned the movement for Jewish national self-determination as a struggle for colonial and racist supremacist privilege. The guide included a postscript by Atik himself, which asserts that Zionism is the problem and labels it a false theology justified by a mythical racial ancestry that promotes death rather than life. Dr. Reverend Dr. Naim Atik, the founder of Sibyl. Notice what he's wearing here? Looks just like a Catholic to me. I would definitely say He's just a professing Protestant Presbyterian who's actually a Jesuit. Sabio claims to seek a just and durable peace for Israelis and Palestinians and has previously called for two sovereign and fully democratic states. This position is belied, however, by both Atik's bitter repudiation of Zionism and Sabil's self-proclaimed vision for the future. The establishment of a binational state in Palestine, Israel. The two-state solution is but a stepping stone toward this goal. This is likely also a major reason why Sabil insists on the Palestinian right of return, i.e. the immigration of over 5 million Palestinian refugees to Israel. With an Israeli population of a little over 6 million Jews and 1.7 million Arabs, this would render Israeli Jews a minority in their own nation state and result in the establishment of an Arab state instead. I'm going to let you read the rest of that. Next up, from reporting from BBC News, Danish election opposition block wins. The pollsters underestimated, underestimated the popularity of the Danish People's Party, as Malcolm Brabant reports. Denmark's opposition parties have beaten the governing coalition after a close general election. The center-right group, led by XPM Prime Minister Lars Locke Rasmussen, beat Prime Minister Hel Thorning-Schmidt's center-left coalition, although her party is the largest. Ms. Thorning-Schmidt has now stood down as a Social Democratic Party leader. The right-wing anti-immigration Danish People's Party will become the second largest in Parliament. With almost all votes counted, the center-right bloc led by Mr. Rasmussen had secured the 90 seats needed to form a government in the 179-seat Parliament. Turnout was 85.8%, the Interior Ministry said. Talks are due to begin soon on forming a cabinet, which correspondents say could take weeks. BBC News also reports Brian Williams to join MSNBC after losing anchor role. Well, he's falling into the into the uh, trap because he was never telling the truth anyway. He's a little devil. Brian Williams had been the anchor of the top-rated newscast newscast in the U.S. U.S. News anchor Brian Williams will not return to his role at NBC Nightly News, but instead join the cable news network MSNBC to cover breaking news. Mr. Williams was suspended in February after reports that he had embellished his recollections about the Iraq war. Lester Holt, who had been filling in during Mr. Williams' suspension, will take over the slot permanently. Mr. Holt becomes the first African-American man to lead a top evening news program. I'm determined to earn back their trust, Mr. Williams said of viewers on Thursday. Mr. Williams is scheduled to appear on the Today Show on Friday morning to further explain his new role. Lester Holt will become the anchor of the NBC Nightly News. Mr. Williams, who was the face of the top-rated U.S. news program since 2004, often spoke on chat show of, of being shot down in a helicopter in Iraq. But in early 2015, veterans who were aboard the helicopter began refuting his account over social media. Mr. Williams and the network 